going to read from Psalm 57. And um, could you all stand while I read, please? And then that way you can you'll be ready at standing when uh, when we start singing. Uh, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge, till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills His purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. Our Father in heaven, uh, we just thank you for your word, and I just pray that uh, as we're singing, um, you will prepare our hearts for learning and listening um, to your word spoken, um, because we are your dear children, we are children of your kingdom, and we know that um, your power preserves us, and, and that your purpose for us, um, that you're, you're preserving us for your purpose for us, and that we would seek that. Um, as we go out um, from here, having learned your message, um, that, that uh, is part of preparing for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, Tim, can I make a correction real quick? I forgot. Music director ends this year, in December. So we have an opening music director. I forgot to mention that. Sorry. Maybe we can talk our end of that one. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Christ, 
chapter. <clears throat> Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you a good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus emphasized the giving nature of Christians, of the many characteristics which distinguish his new life in Christ. Giving is very visible. Giving is a testimony.
such a great person, you would lavish on us such grace. And we praise you, we lift our hands in adoration and thanksgiving. And as we turn our eyes to your word, would you speak to us this morning? And we ask the song. more likely to remember what you say. <laughs> so, yeah. so, this might be the only thing that you remember, I don't know, hopefully I'm not using that up in that uh, thing, but, but nonetheless, here we are. Uh, I was, and I was thinking about this tie that I have, you know, when I got there, uh, I used to teach first and second grade uh, about 30 years ago, and um, and one of my students, Sean Young, who's now actually older than our pastor, uh, gave this to me um, at the end of his first grade year and stuff. And so uh, it's, it means a lot to me. Um, as we uh, as we said, uh, uh, the Operation Christmas Child, uh, you got the boxes if you need to help them together. But um, you know the way it is this year is just grab a box, watch whatever you feel led to do. Uh, please do it, uh, put it together and bring it back, hopefully next week, but if not, uh, in a couple weeks it'll be okay too, uh, we can work it out. Um, but um, I always believe that the Lord uh, will place on the hearts of, of people what they need to give. Um, I, 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 I hate to get emotional like this, but... Um, you know, what got me on, like I told the science school class, was what got me was that little girl that needed shoes. And, uh, and I thought I'd get with the shoes that she needed. You know? Today we are talking about Galatians 1, and we're going to, the title of the message is called The Grace of Christ. Um, and I got 10 pages of notes and hopefully I can get through it. <laughs> I'm looking at that clock, my phone, some son took my phone so I don't have a clock on me on me, but I'm looking at that clock and it says 11.15. I'm thinking that's not good to get started. Um, so bear with me. I'm trying to make this as good as I can, as quick as I can. Um, but we're in Galatians chapter 1, if you want to turn your Bibles there. Um, I appreciate it. And hopefully you can hear me. Uh, Jen trying to turn me up, make sure uh, everybody can hear me in the back. Um, <clears throat> Galatia was uh, a territory. Um, um, Galatia was a territory, uh, uh, not a specific city or church. It was a series of churches. And um, um, you can you can go ahead and sit down. I'm not going to read the scriptures just right now. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to confuse you. <laughs> But, um, yeah, Paul had founded several churches in Galatia, and uh, following his evangelistic efforts, there came men who came in who began to preach, uh, who began to pervert the gospel um, that Paul had taught, the gospel of grace. 
Now, if you tell me that God will forgive me all my sins and account me as righteous and say, I, if I simply believe in Jesus Christ, that's good news. But if you say that I must follow certain rules and regulations, be obedient uh, to the law in order to be righteous, that's not good news. Paul was writing to the Galatians to correct this teaching. That's why he's writing this book. And you remember this was, a lot of times people want to say, well, I want to you know, go back to the early church you know, format, the way things happened. But if you, you look at the early church, they had a lot of problems uh, that crept in pretty quickly. Um, and this was one of them, the Galatians. And Paul was uh, writing to correct that teaching, that he had followed uh, uh, his ministry in their midst, and to free them from the bondage of the law that men were seeking to put them under. Uh, we have so much to be thankful to Paul for, thankful for his uh, stubbornness, his strong steadfastness. My grandmother used to say, I'm not stubborn, I'm steadfast. You know, And uh, in this case, thank God, that Paul was a bit stubborn on the gospel of grace. Uh, because if he hadn't, Christianity could have reverted uh, into just another Jewish sect and been lost in the shuffle. Um, but there's a Christian denomination thinking of it today who has a strict observance to the Sabbath, right? Uh, to the point of legality in order to be righteous. That's not good news. That's legalism. Legalism is any attempt to become righteous by our works, or more righteous through our obedience to the law, uh, is a form of legalism. It was the issue of the Reformation, was it not? Uh, how am I justified? Uh, to the Galatians that brought on this Protestant Reformation, which was a revolution of its own from the corrupted practices of the church of that day, there was a uh, Catholic, uh, uh, he was a German Dominican friar named Johann Tessel, the pastor mentioned him. Uh, he was the, appointed the Inquisitor for Poland and Saxony, and later became the Grand Commissioner for Indulgences to Germany. And he was known for a famous line that says, When in the box the penny rings, the uh, uh, soul from purgatory springs. Right? What was he doing? He was selling indulgences, making money for the church, right? And telling people, if you want to get your loved one out of purgatory, which is not a biblical doctrine, but not a lot of Catholic doctrine that was accepted, if you want to get them out of purgatory, then put some money in the box, right? Pay for your righteousness. Pay for theirs. But you're, uh, this is, this uh, abuse uh, it's one of the things that sparked Martin Luther's reaction uh, and the Reformation. Martin Luther was much like the Apostle Paul in that he was one of those followers who went all out in his religious practices. You know, I, I, if you listen to some of the things about Martin Luther, you know, he used to uh, cut himself, you know, trying to... Uh, absolve himself of sins before God and, and do all sorts of things and there's a whole story of him going to Rome um, and praying on each step all the way up um, that was supposed to be this same staircase that God had supernaturally somehow trans, uh, uh, trans, uh, uh, moved transported from Jerusalem to Rome and uh, even though that's you know it's just Catholic uh, teaching uh, but nonetheless, he's on his knees and praying each step of the way. And when God gets a hold of him and says, Martin, the just shall live by faith. Right? And it burned in his heart so much that it helped bring about the Protestant Reformation. Right? Um, I was looking at it and I was trying to figure out why I wrote this down. But the Greek... Uh, the uh, word, Latin word for righteousness is eustusia, uh, which doesn't necessarily speak to me a whole lot, but the Greek word for righteousness is uh, nomotheta, which we get the word law from. You get the word namas. Um, and so I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking, look, if that's the case, then the Greeks hear the word righteousness 
nomo me tata. Um, they immediately think of the law because that's included in the word. Um, and how am I justified? And you had people coming along saying, you have to be, you know, have to follow these rules and guidelines. And you have to be a good Jew to be a good Christian, you know, and saying all these different things. And so I'm looking at that word and, and saying, that is, you know, seemed to be, could easily be implicit in the first thought of the Greek mind when they hear that word for righteousness. But one of the things that false teachers do right off is they attempt to discredit uh, whoever is teaching the truth. And in this case, the Apostle Paul. If you look in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, right? But through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, right? So what is the first thing that Paul does but affirm his apostleship, right? He says, I'm an apostle, not from men, right? Look at the verse. Not from men, nor through man, but who? But through Jesus Christ and God the Father, right? It's interesting today that even people are asking the same questions uh, as, as they were asked back then. The Pharisees asked John the Baptist, you remember, who gave you this authority to say what you're saying? Right? You remember? They asked Jesus the same question in Mark chapter 11, verse 28, saying, who gave you this authority? Today, one of the questions that uh, a Mormon might have um, is surrounds the sacrament of baptism because they teach that they're the only ones who have the right to baptize anyone. Okay? They're the only true church who has 12 apostles governing the church, and those 12 apostles are the only ones who can uh, ordain or grant authority unto men to exercise spiritual ministry. So their question to you might be, who gave you the authority? In the high church, and we've talked about this in some of the denominations and liturgical uh, churches and stuff, uh, you have the idea of apostolic succession for the laying on of hands. And so as far as the high church goes, you have men ordained for the ministry, and a bishop lays his hand upon the candidate, and that bishop had a, a bishop who laid a hand, had hands upon him, who had hands laid upon him, who had hands laid upon him, who had hands laid upon him, all the way back to... Peter, supposedly. Right? And that's the apostolic succession of the laying on of hands. Right? So if you didn't have a bishop who laid his hands upon uh, you uh, and had hands laid upon him and had hands laid upon him and had hands laid upon him and going all the way back to Peter, then you're not really ordained. Right? Um, Paul says what? He says it's an apostle, not what? From men, nor through men. Right? Here is the apostle to the Gentiles, the one whom God inspired to give us most of the New Testament. Right? And he's not ordained by man. And he's saying it effectively. He's affirming his apostleship. But he's saying, I wasn't ordained by man. I was ordained by God. Through Jesus Christ. Right? I mean, if I was teaching youth at this point, you'd have the mic and he's like, you know. It's done. There's your authority. There's, your, there's where it stops. Okay? The only one who can really ordain a man to the ministry is Christ. Men only ratify that ordination. The same thing that we say in regards to Scripture. What belongs in Scripture is what the church discovers that God had already inspired. Not what the church determines to be in there. Right? Look at verse 2 and 3 of Galatians 1. It says, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before I read that, I should have said one other thing about 
church ordaining people. Sometimes the church has ordained some pretty rotten people, some scoundrels. As one minister says, some charlatans, uh, people who were never true ministers of the gospel. Um, and it, that's one thing that bugs me nowadays is, uh, and I have a friend who did this one time, is you can get your ministerial license online. Yeah. AFE, and you know, you're qualified to get to marry somebody or whatever. And it's not, it doesn't matter what you believe or otherwise. You know. Um, just remember what Paul's doing here. But then he opens this reading and he says, Grace and peace. The Greek word for grace is charis, you know, uh, meaning beauty or charm. It was a typical Jewish greeting. And of course, you know, uh, shalom, which is a typical Greek uh, meaning. But in verse 4 and 5 of Galatians 1, it says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, in speaking of, um, in, now, in speaking of Jesus Christ, Paul declares that he gave himself for our sins, that he might what? Deliver us from this present evil world. You remember in John 14, 30, Jesus calls Satan what? The prince of this world, right? And you remember during the temptation of Christ, uh, that Satan even boasted that the kingdoms of the, this world are his, and that he can give them to whomever he wills. And Jesus didn't dispute that, did he? You remember some of the things that are happening today, and before you want to go and blame God and say, why is God allowing this? You remember things like this, okay? The purpose of Jesus Christ is to deliver you his children from this present evil world. It's God's will that you be delivered from it. And that deliverance is twofold. From the hold that the world has on me and from out of this world. And you know, my son sometimes says, uh, and we've been talking, we you know, have different times we have talk about God and, and what we believe in different things and stuff. And he says, um, sometimes he says, I hate this world because, you know, because of some of the things that happen. You know, and the way things are. And I tell him, I said, son, well, one of the reasons why that is is because of the curse of sin and what it, it has done to this world. And the Bible even says that the whole creation groans because of the curse. Right? Um, so this deliverance that is the purpose of Christ to deliver you is twofold. When you think about that in relation to your salvation, um, you can say that, uh, you know, uh, threefold uh, deliverance in, in regard to sanctification. He has freed me from the penalty of sin. He has freed me from the presence of sin currently, uh, or from the power of sin, and ultimately will deliver me from the presence of sin. Right? Um, verses 6 and 7 in Galatians 1 say this. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you. Now, before I go any further on that, isn't it funny? Like I said, sometimes people will say, well, I want to go back to the early church and the way the early church was and stuff. And then, like I said, this Paul's speaking to places that was part of the early church, right? And what's he saying to him? He says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. There's a title of our message today, right? Unto another gospel. How quickly. You know, Christ repeatedly talked about how important it is to hold fast to the truth, right? And not to add things. But what is the human fallen nature to do but to add to what God has said, right? I mean, go back all the way to Genesis 3 and see what Satan said to Eve. And you'll see the fact that Eve added something to something that God never said, right? Whether she intended to or whether it was just kind of, you know, I just want to have something to say or what, I don't know. But she said something that God didn't say. I'll let you look it up and see what it was. Uh, if you don't already know. 
But he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul immediately gets right into the issue. They were called into the grace of Christ. Okay? It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can you deserve. It's not something you can purchase. Right? Like uh, like the joke about the guy that uh, wanted to be buried with his car, you know, he had a Cadillac and, uh, and he was kind of a high roller and had a lot of money and stuff and he wanted to be buried with $100 bills stuck between his fingers and stuff and he had to purchase a, a plot big enough to put his car in and stuff and, and when put him behind the seat and put his hands on the wheels with the dollar, $100 bills between his, you know, hands and stuff and everything keys in the ignition and stuff, and we're all ready to roll, right? And start at once, right? It's like the guy that says, uh, says you know, you know, somebody, a uh, death angel, whatever comes, says, it's your time. So, okay, well, uh, let me take my gold with me, you know? And no, no, you can't do that. No, I can't take anything with you. Oh, come on, you know, it's the only thing I really have is true, true value. So he gets there. And the angels look at him and say, why do you want to bring more pavement? Okay. You know? Um, it's not something you can purchase. Um, the grace of Christ, you can only receive it as a free gift of God on the basis of your simple trust in Christ. You know? Uh, in preparation for this, my, I was listening to different things and stuff and everything, and, and my son, um, I didn't know, it was, I thought he was asleep in the back of the car, and, uh, and uh, after this message that I was listening to and finished and stuff, he says to me, he says, he says, Daddy, I get it. And I said, you know, I was like, well, you get what? He says, why Jesus died? You know? And uh, I said, I said, why? And he says, so, he says, well, if he didn't die, We'd still be in sin and be bad people. I said, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, but sometimes you don't need to add anything. The Spirit of God speaks to the heart of a child in a simple way that says more than you can say in any way you can try. Verse 7. Verse 7 says, which is not another. It says, not that there is another one, but that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. It is a perversion of the gospel. There are still those today who are perverting the good news of Jesus Christ by again placing man under certain legal obligations and restraints, imposing their rules, their regulations, their standards for holiness. You know, one of the things we look at in our studies in the Sunday school and the denominations is some of this. That people have imposed certain things that they consider to make them righteous as opposed to someone who doesn't. You know, it's the religion of the haves and the have-nots or the do's and the don'ts, right? Uh, this is not the gospel. If you give me a list of rules that I must abide by in order to be spiritual, that is not the gospel. If you tell me I have to worship on Saturday and not Sunday to be righteous, that is not the gospel. That is adding to the gospel. You might be feel compelled to do that, and if you want to, that's fine. But start turning around and saying to everyone that you must be this way or it must be that way is legalism. It's not. It's a legalistic relationship, not a loving relationship. Legalistic relationships <laughs> is trying to follow the rules, striving to follow the regulations, signing a pledge and committing yourselves uh, to do this or not do this or the other thing. It's like the old uh, adage says, uh, I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't go with girls who do. Right? Remember that one? Um, well, that doesn't make you more righteous. Right? Um, may make you feel good about yourself, or make you feel better than someone else, but it doesn't make you more righteous. 
such a legalistic relationship merely results in feeling doubly guilty. There's one pastor who talked about one time going to a dance and he says, I felt so guilty about it because I felt because I enjoyed it. You know? <laughs> and uh, that's that's the legalistic side of things in our relationship with Christ that we need to be careful about. When you truly come into the knowledge of the grace of God through Christ, you enter a loving relationship, not a legal one. You say, you might say, oh well, then you do whatever you want. Well, yeah. But as J. Vernon McGee says, he says, God changes your wanter. Right? I don't necessarily want to do the things that I used to do before I came to Christ. Right? I want to do what pleases the Father. Right? So do I do what I want? Yes, in that respect, because I'm following what God wants me to do, not what I want to do. Now, someone said, if you put up a sign that says, stay off the grass or don't touch, guess what I'm going to do? <laughs> it's just human nature, right? Uh, but the truth be told, since coming into a grace and loving relationship with God, I don't want to touch. I don't want to walk on grass. Not because, you know, of me, but because of my relationship with Him. And He changes what I want. And it's like David says, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Right? I begin to want what he wants. Right? That's part of that sanctification process. If it doesn't please the Father, I don't want to do it. So this gospel that they're proclaiming, trying to put the people into a legalistic relationship with God, Paul says is not really another gospel. It's a version of the gospel. In verse 8 of Galatians 1 says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. That was the uh, cry of uh, the early or the Middle Ages in the Catholic Church. You know, let him be anathema. Right? That's the Greek word there for accursed, anathema. The ironic and popular cry of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. But even if an angel comes, uh, and to the Mormon he might say, even if Moroni would come and say, you've got to wear a certain kind of underwear in order to be righteous, or you've got to go through the temple rites and be a faithful Mormon in order to be saved. You see, that's adding to the gospel. That's adding to salvation through the grace of God offered to us through Christ. Chuck Smith once said, uh, a former student of his, who had left Christianity and become a Mormon, he says, what's the basis of your hope for eternal life? And the Mormon replied, my faith in Jesus Christ and continued membership in the Mormon church. <laughs> Chuck replied, well, as far as I'm concerned, you went one step, one step too far. If you said the basis for your hope in eternal life was simply in Christ alone, I can shake hands with you and say, continue, brother. But the moment you add anything, anything to that, then it's another gospel. And that's what Paul is saying here in Galatians. They were doing, they were adding to it. It's grace plus. You know, like all the streaming services now, Disney plus and whatever else, you know, everything's plus plus. But now you have grace plus, right, in Galatians. And he says, that's not the gospel, that's another gospel. That's a perversion of the gospel. Galatians 1.8 says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema or cursed. Verses 9 and 10 say, As we said before, so, I, so say I now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul wasn't seeking to win a popularity contest, was he? He says, I'm seeking to please God. In essence, Paul is saying, I could give up this fight, I could give in to legalism, but if I did, I would not be a true servant of God. Thank God he stuck to his guns, right? The church would be something radically different had Paul not stuck to his guns. 
But I certify you, verse 11, brethren, that the gospel was preached to me as not after man, for I neither received it of man, nor neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm certain that God chose Paul from his mother's womb for the very purpose that God laid out for him. From the road to Damascus and beyond, you can see the hand of God working in the life of Paul. Uh, just like I said with those shoe boxes and how God gets those to the right child that they belong to. He is working since this time and even before, from the creation, from the, before the foundation of the world, to bring about his purpose and his will. And he's doing so through here, in this example, through the Apostle Paul. Um, for sake of time, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. i got just a little bit more, I promise I won't keep you much longer. Peter could not have been this emissary of grace because Peter did not follow the law circumspectly like Paul had. Right? We talked about this in Sunday school and we talked about the kind of up and down life of Peter. I mean, he goes from, you know, uh, saying, you know, you are the son of the living God, and wow, who, I wish I would have been able to say, think of that answer, to get behind me Satan, you know, uh, in the next step. Uh, because he's rebuking the Lord for thinking he's doing something or saying something that he shouldn't. Um, Paul wasn't, or Peter wasn't uh, ordained for this, Paul was. Paul was especially prepared by God to receive the gospel of grace and it came to him by direct revelation. Verse 13 and 14 says, For ye have heard my of my conversation in time past in the Jewish religions, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jewish religion above many my equals in my own nation. Being more, ex uh, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Paul was the top of his class, right? He was the best of the best, right? In his own testimony, he says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? He went all out for the law and for Judaism. And in fact, in this, in, that, in verse 14, he says, above many my equals in my own nation, right? You couldn't have found anybody that kept the law better than I did, right? And he's saying what? He's saying to tell somebody they have to do that to be in a relationship with Christ is adding to it, is a perversion of the gospel, right? In verse 15 and 16 he says, But when it pleased God, who separated me uh, from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, and that's one reason why right there I say that God ordained him from the very beginning for this purpose, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. What? <laughs> he didn't go and say, okay guys, did I get it right? You know? Where did he go? He goes out into the desert. As my father used to say, he went into desert university. Right? Into Arabia. Right? And he spends this time listening to Christ who gives him this revelation. He did not immediately look to his Christian brothers to learn about Christianity. He did not want to be uh, perverted from what some of the things that were to being taught here. He went out of the desert and spent several years in the desert uh, waiting for God and receiving the revelation directly from Christ according to grace. And so you can say that this is not Paul's gospel, but whose? Christ's gospel. Right? Because he got it from direct revelation from Christ, right? Who in turn delivered it to us. And like you said in verse 16, he says, What? I said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. He didn't even return to Jerusalem for like six to seven years after his conversion. If you look at the math, if you look at what he did, right? He didn't, he went back to Damascus, but then it was another three years or so before he ended up going to Jerusalem. Next week we're going to look at the council and what happened there in Galatians 2. Uh, but six or seven years. In verse 17 it says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were the apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and I abode with him fifteen days. 
but of the apostle of but, of, but other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. Did return to Jerusalem for six to seven years. Paul needed to know more, so he went out to the deserts of Arabia and waited for Christ to give him the glorious revelation for another three and a half years. Verse 20 and 21 says, Now the things I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and uh, Cilicia. And one of the things you find is what does Paul do? He returns back, and after a time he returns to Tarsus <coughs> and tent making. Right? You know, I, 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 I was talking about this before, you know, Jesus calling the, the Pharisees brood of vipers and stuff like that. You know, these guys don't necessarily go about a typical sales uh, marketing ploy of trying to attract people, right? He goes back to what he was doing, and in, in this case, Christ went called these uh, Pharisees and stuff a brood of vipers. Um, not exactly what you would promote, you know, say how to do something. But what were they doing? They were teaching the truth and trying to get people to give an honest look at uh, what it means to be a follower of Christ. And in verse 22 it says, And was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ, that they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which, was, which he once destroyed. And what? And they glorify God in me. Right? See, the Jerusalem church uh, and the followers there, the Christians there, were a little bit reluctant to receive Paul, and Paul knew that. Right? And rightfully so. You know, I mean, this was uh, the guy who was going out to destroy. I mean, you look in the book of Acts, and he says, I'm out to destroy the way, as they were known. Right? So one of the things that Paul is doing here is he is emphasizing the fact that his gospel is not something that was passed unto him by the apostles or by any man. It came to him through direct revelation of Christ. And that's why he starts his gospel the way he does right at the beginning. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from man, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. And if anyone comes, whether it's me, or an angel, or anybody else who comes and tells you otherwise, let him be anathema, cast out, excommunicated. He's not part of the true gospel. Let's stand. You bow your head and close your eyes. You know, um, I don't know what you uh, may be going through this morning, or what you're dealing with, or in the past what you may have dealt with. Something that comes to mind when the Spirit of God begins to speak to you. But I'm part of the old school, and I like an invitation. So if you have something that you need to get right with, whether it's coming to know the Lord or it's something that you've been harboring for some time, um, I want you to come. We're going to give you a few minutes here while our place.
something good for the soul that just uh, comes and gets, meets God where he's at. He says, come as you are. And sometimes we allow things to get in the way, for whatever reason, pride, don't you lay a seat. But I just want you to know that as you walk out of here today, that you're in that loving relationship with God that Paul's talking about. And if you can do that, you can look at me in the eye and say, we're good, and great. But if not, I want you to think about that and let the Spirit of God speak to your heart and get it right.